Welcome everyone. I'm Dave Meinhard here in Detroit at the Michigan headquarters of the Vatacuti Foundation. I want to thank and welcome you to the second Vatacuti Scholar webinar being presented by Dr. Ajay Sharma, the Royal Liverpool University Hospital Consultant in Transplant and General Surgery. He joins us from Liverpool, England. A highly published author, he has 79 papers in indexed journals, five book chapter contributions, and has presented over 100 research papers in various national and international societies. He helped establish a leprosy center near Lucknow in 1992 and volunteers annually helping uplift tribal people in rural central India. His work teaching, mentoring, and clinical training continues to this day. He was recently appointed clinical sub-dean for the FRCS at the Royal Liverpool University Hospital. His presentation today is entitled Critical Appraisal of Literature. We are going to find out why some experts claim that many medical studies may not be worth the paper they are printed on and what makes good, honest clinical research. Along the day, Dr. Sharma will include cricket matches, autograph seeking, and many other things to make the topic interesting. We are also being joined by Vatikuti Foundation CEO, Dr. Mahendra Bhandari, who Dr. Sharma calls my guru. I'm guessing that we may hear more about that in the next few minutes. Dr. Bhandari is a respected professor, urologist, kidney transplant surgeon, and the director of research for the Vatikuti Urology Institute here in Detroit at the Henry Ford Health System. This is the second presentation of the Vatikuti Scholar Series. It is an internet forum designed to help inform young medical professionals, people like you. Please let your friends and colleagues know about this opportunity, and please let us know at the Vatikuti Foundation how we might make the upcoming sessions in the series even better to meet your needs. I'm going to change over to Dr. Bondari, who is in Cleveland, Ohio today. So we're going to change it to him right now. And welcome, Dr. Bondari. Thank you, Dave and Ajay, for Thanks. this webinar. I welcome everybody with greetings from Buddy Goody Foundation. In this preamble, I plan to answer three questions. Why webinars? In my own career and in the career of hundreds of trainees who touched my life, I encountered that there is a very little information given to them what would be expected out of them in different roles they are likely to play in their career plans. It's a totally different culture of whether you want to practice in England or United States or India. But the basic soft skill requirement remains the same, irrespective of the fact you are um, uh, what you call uh, academician or a practicing urology, it doesn't make a difference. So that's why what the Foundation thought that how can we shape the future of these young medical graduates who have all the enthusiasm and zeal to work hard, but there's very little in terms of organized guidance. Why did we choose the subject of critical appraisal of the literature? Critical appraisal of the literature is absolutely essential for you to know and to do the opportunity cost of time. At the end of reading an article, if you find that it was a wastage of three hours, it's not worth it. Hence, we thought of this subject. And Dr. Sharma, I know, is going to talk of three kinds of biases. This is how I dubbed him. One bias, which we can honestly work on and take care of with our statistical tools. Second bias, I'll bring in the human bias, which would mean definitive biases, vividness biases. They are not professional dishonesty but they go with our human tendency. And I don't know whether Dr. Sharma would propose any statistical method to get over those biases. As Aurobindo said, intellectual partisanism. You would try to prove whatever you have in the mind, bringing that selective literature. And the third bias is a hard professional dishonesty. And when Dr. Sharma talks of the statistical methods, 
I would say a good number of people use statistics to prove their point, which goes above the head of the editor and reviewer. So I think we look forward to a very, very exciting one hour of discussion. Enjoy yourself. And then uh, it's an interactive forum. So please, uh, this is the second one. Thank you very much for sparing time on some Saturday. Uh, I would now hand over to Dr. Sharma, who is at Liverpool. Welcome, Dr. Sharma. Few words about Dr. Sharma. I had known him for years in different roles as a surgeon, as a transplant surgeon, as a, one of the bright postgraduates. And now he has multiple roles in terms of social service, and maybe it's at uh, Bilaspur in Chhattisgarh or Leprosy Asylum uh, uh, Hospital in, uh, in Lucknow. So he is an interesting character, so to say, avid cycling expert, cross-country drive, and I have to keep up the promise of cycling with him in Liverpool whenever I go and look him up next time. Welcome, Dr. Sharma, and it's all yours. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Dave, for bringing us together, and many thanks, Professor Murari, sir, for asking me to do this presentation. As you said that, uh, you know, 99% of the literature, maybe more than that, once you go through that literature, which is published, and as you know, there's a explosion of uh, uh, different journals, and every year you see uh, newer journals, and there's explosion of all this information. So what to take and what not to take is a very big, very uh, critical question. Very often you would see many of us uh, in the past may have had, oh yeah, I've read this article and I'll try this new procedure or new approach. It is not like that. As I said that the evidence which actually is given in, is in front of you. You and me need to develop those skills as to which data to really believe and which one not. And I must say, as Professor Bhanai mentioned, that uh, all of us are biased in favor of some uh, approach or against another approach. Not that we are being dishonest about it, but it just it is our belief. But uh, and at times not always tested to the statistician delight properly. All I'm trying to say is that once you do this critical literature of uh, critical appraisal of literature again and again, and you develop that skill, then it becomes a second habit. So I would, uh, the purpose of my presentation is to make you gain some confidence in organizing a journal club. And uh, at the end of it, you would develop some confidence that uh, you would be able to organize a journal club and uh, you would have a good idea about some key terms used in applied statistics. So the, uh, this is a picture, typical picture. Not all the people are there at eight o'clock in the morning. Um, like uh, some of the American centers or SGPGI or AIMS where most residents would be there at 8 o'clock if the general club or teaching starts. But all I'm trying to say is that it's, you can do a general club or a cup of coffee. And uh, all one has to do is if one of the team members has already gone through an article and I would say that mark the article and the, with, with the comments from the point of view of statistics and from the subject specific point of view in red if he thinks it is something objectionable or something you do not agree with that or a point which you would like to really improve upon if you are asked to do the same study again. In the green I would write the findings uh, which are really uh, which I would agree with and which I would like to carry further if I have to do the similar study again. So uh, in green I would highlight those uh, features which are good points about that article. So the question to you is that how often does do you have a journal club in your department? Is it once a week, once a fortnight, once a month, or never? So I'll put this question to you, and if you can think about it and go for the poll, and uh, I would request Dave to put that. And if you could reply uh, on a scale of one is to five, if you uh, if I ask you the question, how confident are you in doing a general club. So these are two questions which I have requested to be put up and I'll wait for the answer. Over to Dave for a moment. Hi Dr. Sharma. 
We are looking at the poll right now. We have 25% say once in a fortnight, 70% say once a month, 10% say never, and nobody does them once a week. So mm -hmm. I'm going to close this poll and show it, and then you have a second poll. Here's the results yeah. again. Is 20% once a fortnight, 70% once a month, and 10% never. I'm going to go to your second poll now, yeah. which is how confident are you in doing a journal club presentation? One is not very confident. Five is very confident. And okay. people are voting. So later on, they can really write some free text there in the chat, and we can really have some access to that. What do you think, what do they think are the impediments? What actually uh, are the kind of hurdles or difficulties or challenges in organizing a general club? It could be a very busy schedule. It could be that you do not have access to the articles, which may be there, or there may not be anybody to guide you. So if you could really think in that way and write some uh, one or two sentences in chat, that would be I'm, great. I'm going to close the second poll, and here's the results, okay? Half the people voted, and so far 22% are on number four, so they're, they're pretty confident. 11% are right in the middle with a number three. Mm -hmm. 33% are not very confident, and 33% answered number one, so no confidence about doing a journal club presentation. Interestingly, nobody answered number five, so there's nobody that's super confident okay. about it. Okay, okay. So everybody that... below, I'm going to hide the results and give you back control. Yeah. All I can say is that uh, I must say that in 1986, when I joined Surgery Unit 3 at Ames as a junior resident, Professor Amman Kapoor would make sure that this remains a weekly activity. And later on, when I reached SDPJ, of course, my department was different. And we learned from Professor Bandari's department that, yeah, they do have, uh, they did have, and still continue to have very active general club and teaching activity. So other departments also learned from that. So all I'm trying to say is that. Not everybody has to be Professor M.M. Kubur or Bhandari, uh, and uh, anyone uh, can really be able to, should be able to run these general clubs. Now, uh, I, if I say that, you know, I'm quite crazy about cricket, and uh, just to simplify, just to save you from uh, the jargon of uh, statistics or scientific jargon, I'm trying to use some of the cricketing examples. Uh, if I mention it to my daughter, she would really be quite uh, annoyed that, uh, you know, uh, she doesn't like my cricketing examples. But uh, I know many of you are from India, so it would be quite easy. And uh, But even the Americans should not really have any uh, difficulty in understanding because it was the first time a cricket match was held, international match was held, uh, was between American team, USA team, and the United Provinces of Canada in, 19, in 1844. So uh, that was the first ever international match. So coming to what I'm going to show, this is a picture of MCG in Melbourne, and this is a picture of Waka in Perth, and uh, where the recent uh, World Cup I went there to watch. And uh, I'll put one question. The null hypothesis says that the ball bounce in at the cricket pitch in MCG is similar to that of VOCA. Now, null hypothesis always shows the question in a way that both the groups or more than one group are similar. In contrast, if you say the same question in the form of alternative, alternate hypothesis, one would really frame it in a way ball bounce on the cricket pitch at MCG is lower than that at VOCA. And all the cricket pundits are quite keen to know what kind of bounce a pitch is going to have because constitution of team would be determined by that. So this is the picture of the scoreboard which showed on that day between India versus South Africa more than 86,000 people attended it. So if you're going to ask uh, you know, uh, the question, you're not going to be able to ask the question to all the 86,000. It is massive, impractical, 
unthinkable and unnecessary. So which group you are going to choose, I'm trying to point out with pointer whether you're going to choose this one or you're going to choose this uh, group which is perpendicular to the pitch or you're going to go to the eastern side or to the western side. Obviously you're going to choose a correct point so uh, that you can watch the mouse properly. And uh, if similarly the uh, survey was done in uh, Waka as well. So of course it's an imaginary survey. So at MCG 35 out of 150 observations uh, showed that the ball bounce was too high in contrast to 55 at Waka. Again not surprising to you, those who have interest in cricket, the p-value was 0 0.01. See, whatever this percentage is, it is uh, something like uh, um, something like 22 percent or so. Uh, MTG uh, in another study, 10 times this uh, data was collected, and if it showed 350 out of 1500, and similar figures if it showed at Waka 550 out of 1500, you can appreciate that the percentage of the orbs is very similar similar percentage at both sides. But the p-value, you can notice it is so different, 0 0.01 over here versus less than 0 0.00, four zeros and one. Why is it like that? You know, when we are talking about comparing two groups, you are really looking for p-value when you would really, somebody is talking in your department about publishing a paper or uh, writing a paper or doing a study, all you are really looking for is what is p-value? How do you derive that? And what is this, whether it is significant or not? What does he do? You need to understand what it really means. All it says is, if I'll just explain to you, this p-value of 0.01 is, there's one in 100 chances is that, that difference between two groups is just by, just by chance rather than uh, the real difference. So, which obviously means that 99 out of 100 chances are that this observation is correct. So, and the p-value actually shows the degree of confidence with which you can say that the difference between two groups is there or there's a correlation between two groups. That's what p-value P -value would really uh, indicate, the confidence. The next study, which I'm talking about, another hypothetical study, in the terms of null hypothesis, one would explain the question to take autograph from players is equally difficult at both the grounds. At MCG, at the end of a game, it was seen, the, it was recorded that only 6 out of 200 people got autographs. At Waka, 22 out of 190 people got autographs. The p-value was 0 0.001. So it obviously shows that at Waka it is easier to take the autograph. And you can go back to those pictures, you can see that the type of ground it is. It is so easy to access the players there and uh, in contrast to multi-story the stadium there. So coming back to the uh, question over there, there's a type 1 error here that the difference between two groups need not to be and should not be there, MCG versus Vaca, but uh, as far as ability to take, of somebody to take autograph. But just because accessibility is uh, can be different, just because somebody is at the time of survey is in the open part of the ground, which is not there in MCG, you will have difference. This kind of error is actually type 1 error, which actually means the null hypothesis is wrongly rejected. I'll say it, I'll paraphrase it, is that the difference between two groups is not there, but the study shows a difference between two groups. And if you extrapolate it in terms of a new drug, it will show if there is type 1 error that new drug is better than the old one and you are going to start using the new one and which obviously means you are under the wrong impression that the new drug is better, which it is not. So these kind of errors can very well be there. The way of reducing that error is, of course, designing the study properly and keeping the p-value at 0 0.05 or even further lesser. So that's how uh, the alpha error is so important when you define what alpha error you are going to accept. So as you can see, the type of uh, grounds are so different and if you happen to be, when you're doing survey in the easily accessible part, I've just repeated myself the same thing. 
Next uh, is another sporting analogy related, again related to cricket here is the null hypothesis that the water intake of the spectators at Waka is similar to that of MCG. The question here is that of course uh, those people who are going to make arrangements at the stadium about so many spectators coming about the water supply or the supply of drinks so they need to make plans so therefore they study and we know that Perth is much much hotter uh, and than uh, Melbourne is but according to this study which was done it showed uh, in a period of four hours out of 18 people who were studied per person intake was 3.21 liters in four hours compared to at MCG 3.09 so there was no difference p-value was more than 0 0.05 is it really uh, you, would you really believe that of course the study has been done this is a type 2 error I can tell you that lots of surgical studies would have type 2 error which means null hypothesis is wrongly accepted so I don't want to really use the scientific jargon here or rather tongue twisters or something which can be quite confusing I would paraphrase it again that type 2 error is when the difference between two groups is there really but the study does not show that difference so this is another example of that so now I'm going to use some more examples to uh, bring home some key messages and uh, you know when you are given a paper you would really be asking whether it's a double blind control trial whether it's an observational study it's a cross-sectional study or it's a longitudinal study in a longitudinal study whether it's a cohort or it's a uh, case control or it's a diagnostic study so you need to really look at what kind of study this is so this is the abstract of that paper the schools in northwest of England were randomly allocated to two groups as you can see these are the individuals uh, who are really placed in groups so it is the schools which have been randomized rather than the individuals rather than the subjects or the pupils in group A uh, the year students in all those schools which were randomized to group A they were given practical nutrition training in school kitchen in group B the nutrition training was given using lecture series at the end of six months they were given 25 multiple choice questions to ask about the nutrition value of various foods and the performance of both the groups was compared so what kind of study this could be so I would make you think uh, what kind of study it is I'll give you a few seconds you can jot down your answers so yeah thank goodness it happened at a time when I had given deliberate gap actually and that gap was given so that uh, the audience or the students could write their preferences as to what it is so if you see it is a cluster randomization it's a group of patients group of subjects who have been randomized and uh, it is a parallel design rather than a crossover trial and it's a prospective cohort prospectively designed it's not a retrospective study so just to tell you that sometimes you might hear the randomization either cluster randomization block randomization is another type of randomization or the stratified randomization so these are different types of randomization we can address that some other time uh, time today doesn't allow us to really venture into that territory I'll give you another example here in 1995 to 96 phase 3 trial was conducted in Liverpool transplant unit I may ask you what actually is the phase 3 trial you might really ask uh, what obviously means what phase 1 trial is or phase 2 trial is so just to recapitulate a phase 1 trial is it's a new drug which has been assessed and you are going to really see what kind of upper limit of dose what kind of toxicity it is it has so that is phase 1 phase 2 you are going to look at the whatever best therapeutic responses you can get phase 3 is you are going to do formal control trial and phase 4 is uh, a post uh, marketing study you see, use the drug in different groups so just to give you that introduction of phase 3 184 patients were randomized and you can see in group A and group B the randomization shows it is not an equal number and that's what happens at times randomization done properly 
need not to have exactly similar figures on both sides. Group A had at the time what was new drug at the time, MMF, given in addition to cyclosporin. Group B had what was standard at the time, ASA, hyperin plus cyclosporin. And uh, their data was analyzed in 2011 and uh, the subjects were compared for graph survival. So this is a one-to-one -one randomization. Uh, individual, individuals and patients were randomized. It was a randomized controlled trial. It is an interventional study, as you can see. It is not just observation study. The intervention was done using MMF, coming back to the next slide. And it was a prospective cohort. I'll give you another example, which actually is another study wherein we are looking at the effect of age on the overall outcome in the of that of the transplants. So in that time period, 1975 to 94, patients who were older uh, individuals who were transplanted older than 60 years were compared to that of with those who were younger than 60 years. The outcome was that patients who had older patients who had non-palpable blood vessels, means those who had got peripheral vascular disease and history of smoking were more likely to die with function graft. So what kind of study it is? So I'll give you a few seconds to think about it and write down your observations, what you think. So in a moment, I'm going to show you the next slide. So you already know the list of questions which I'm going to really expect you to reply. It is a retrospective study. You can see that they went back into, we went back into time. And the cohort was defined whenever they were transplanted in this period, and we followed them up subsequently. So it was a cohort, even though it started in retrospective time. Was it an interventional study? No, transplant just happened at that time. Uh, and it just happened to be there, irrespective of the study, which was, study was planned later on. So it was an observational study. Next, I give you another example. I'm just using one after the other examples uh, because otherwise the statistics, as you know, is very boring. Uh, so let us use this example. It's a large group of GP practices and the data from those practices was used and all the patients who had lung cancer were compared with a group of patients who had similar demographic characteristics but didn't have lung cancer. So uh, what was done was that th those patients who had lung cancer were compared, their risk factors were compared uh, when they went back and found out what the risk factors were, such as the smoking occupation. It was seen that the patients, uh, pe the people who uh, had lung cancer, they had 14 times more likely chances of having 10 years smoking history. So this is a typical example that there is an association between smoking and the lung cancer, development of lung cancer. But uh, even though association is there, it, that's what it shows, but it does not mean that there is a causation. So all I'm trying to say is association not always is same, is synonymous as causation. So the answer which uh, I'm going to expect from, your, from the questions is it's a longitudinal study. It's a case control study. And as you can see that the results were shown as odds ratio. So odds ratio rather than risk ratio. You might wonder why we are not really showing it as risk ratio. So the odds ratio is uh, when you have really uh, looked at the event happening versus not happening. That ratio is would be called odds of happening versus not happening. The ratio of relative risk, which is much more liked by the uh, by the statistician, the relative risk is actually the risk of event happening out of all those who are exposed to it. So I'm trying to highlight the point here. Do you think if you go back to this, all the people who were smoking 10 years ago, uh, or all those who are not smoking, do we really know their numbers? The answer is no. So because here, over here, the denominator is not available. 
Therefore, all you can say is what's of happening versus not happening. So in case control study, you can never ever talk about relative risk. All you can say is odds of happening versus odds of not happening or ratio. Now you might have heard about what actually is hazard ratio depicted over here as HR. How is it different from OR and RR? My answer without uh, actually using any scientific jargon here is whenever there is a timeline of event happening in one group versus event happening in another group over a period of timeline, that timeline could be a few weeks, could be years. That is a time when you study the regression analysis, assuming that the risk is, they are exposed to the same risk over a period of time, you are talk, going to talk about hazard ratio. And that's the differential between, uh, you know, two groups as far as the event happening is concerned or not. Now coming to the main question which we are really going to ask, how to read a paper? I'm going to, before we go, uh, before I show you different uh, principles and different steps, I'm going to show you these findings which will help you really to understand what goes on. As Professor Bhandari mentioned to you that uh, number of studies which are published would have bias, how to minimize the bias. And as you know, you and me, we all are only human and howsoever uh, intentions are, good intentions are, howsoever honest somebody might be, we all are biased in favor of the other approach. So what John Lona did, uh, did was that uh, he has uh, summarized the findings of usual typical errors and flaws in studies, studies published in very reputed journals. So he mentioned that, uh, I'm just going to come to the next point here is, flaw number one, is smaller the study conducted in a scientific field, the less likely the research findings are going to be true. I've given you the example uh, about the sample size previously, and as you can see, uh, as I've shown in that uh, uh, previous example of, uh, you know, the ball bouncing uh, at one pitch versus the other one, the smaller the study, less reliable the results are going to be. The next uh, flaw, user flaw is that the smaller the effect size in a, a scientific field, the less likely the research findings are going to be true. What do you understand by that? So I'll just give you one example here. I know many of you may not have worked in vascular surgery. Just to give you an example, in 70s and 80s, there were many studies which were published using different drugs like nephrodrophyril, pantoxifylin, nicotinic acid. So those studies showed some of these drugs improved the claudication distance from, for example, 200 yards to 250 yards. And these tests showed, oh yeah, great difference. And yes, it's statistically significant. It's worth publishing. It's a great drug. Is it really? Do you notice that the difference uh, in two groups, uh, you know, of two observations improved from 200 to 250 yards? That treatment effect of 50 yards, is it really of any value, any clinical value? No. So just to point out over here, if you keep the treatment effect size very small, you can prove anything. And again, I'm just quoting Professor Bhandari here is that, by using statistical jugglery, I call it, you can prove anything. You can use any test and over a period of time, if you keep using tests, you are going to have something which is going to show, oh yes, there is significant correlation, oh yes, there is significant difference. That is not scientific honesty. You need to really be able to stick to the test which you defined, identified, planned at the outset of the study. So coming back to the effect size, all I'm saying is if you keep a effect size small, the tests are going to show the significant difference, but even though it is far from the truth. So what you have to really be careful is that, has a clinician identified that treatment effect size? You could really see if the uh, you know treatment effect size could be whether the uh, 
receptors uh, uh, in one group uh, are better seen than the other group. So what actually is going to be the difference? So you need to really keep that. It's a clinical decision. So the next question, uh, next uh, point which John highlighted was the flaw number three. The greater the number of tested relationship in a scientific field, less likely the results are going to be true. What do you mean by that? Just only moments ago I mentioned this uh, phenomenon. We all had to do that. Trying to use do the salami or chopping of the data and chopping it again and again and testing it again and again. And then you'll find, oh yes, this test is showing. So that is not right. And that's what it happens even in many of the articles published in reputed journals. We have to guard against us from being gullible from that point of view. So what you have to do is, what I'm trying to say is, if you keep doing lots of tests, there are ways of overcoming that. It's called bone family correction. That obviously is going to reduce the alpha error to such a small number, which will take care of the effect, the flaw, because of doing the test again and again. Flaw number four, greater the flexibility in design and definition, and analytical modes in the field, less likely the research findings are going to be true. With this I mean if you are at the time of study you have got inclusion and exclusion criteria. If you keep uh, uh, these inclusion and exclusion criteria rather uh, you know flexible, the team doesn't criteria, then it, the outcomes are going to be far from being true. I'm going to finish these uh, last two flaws. Uh, the reason, as I mentioned to you, that it is good to know the typical usual flaws in this series, which will help you to identify, oh yes, these points I also can notice. So the flaw number five is that the greater the financial interest, less likely the research findings are going to be true. I don't need to comment on that. There's enough data to support this view. Flaw number six, hotter the scientific field, less likely the research findings are going to be true. I'll give you a typical example. It's a new finding, so it's a new drug or it's a new procedure and as many of us like to show, yeah, I'm a better laparoscopic surgeon, I can do polystechny using the single incisional laparoscopic uh, uh, surgery cells. In fact, I'm not being contemptuous towards that. I'm, I usually call it silly way of doing it. Why do you want to really do a surgery in more complex way, you know, by bent out uh, instruments and then uh, flouting the simple rule of having uh, you know the uh, three-point uh, orientation of a, a target, uh, triangulation of the target. So uh, that is my belief and uh, if you look at the articles published in BJS or some other journals it would show that uh, laparoscopic cholestectomy is by SILS is as good as the standard lap poly. That's what it has shown by using 80 or 100 patients. Is it really right? What actually is meaningful is you need to look at the bile duct injury. And as you know, bile duct injury, the probability of that happening in lab cola is 1 in 150 to 1 in 300. Of course, in open surgery, it is 1 in 300 to 1 in 600. That's what we quote. All I'm trying to say here is that if a endpoint, the primary endpoint is rare or uncommon, you need a large sample size to prove that. Just by doing 80 or 100 patients and that study, it doesn't really show you anything. Even if it shows non-superiority or equivalence, that doesn't mean much. You might have heard as or last two days, there's a lot of talk about uh, elections in UK. You might have switched on BBC or CNN or the Indian channels, uh, the NDTV. Whatever news you like to watch, in 15 minutes they can show you the whole world news. This uh, slide shows, uh, you know, I'm, all I'm trying to say is that you can read the whole world news, you can get to know whole world news in 15 minutes. Why not, uh, you know, even in two minutes, it's quite a long time and uh, you can quite easily summarize the findings of an abstract or an article and really show it at the beginning of a presentation of an article just to introduce the topic to people and just to tell you what the general what the article shows 
and what your quick opinion about is and then move further. So it's a good skill to have that you are able to summarize the whole abstract in two minutes. Make your own summary rather than uh, reciting the results there. Now making your own summary actually uh, comes by practice. If you keep doing it again and again or a cup of coffee, you go to cafeteria for lunch, pick up an article from your pocket and just present it to the team. So uh, it's a very important skill which you can easily acquire. As you know, the articles are written in the order inbred usually, introduction and for methods, R for results and D for discussion. When you are looking at the introduction, I usually go to the last line of the introduction or the background. This clearly defines what the, or should define, what the objective of the study is. Sometimes it may not be in consonance with the topic of the study and uh, it may not really be of your interest or, or your current practice, but uh, it is very important to really uh, pick up articles uh, according to the problems you see in your clinical practice. And that way you can get wiser, your understanding of the subject gets better. Look at what journal it is from. I can tell you British Journal of Surgery has got impact factor of 4.8 nowadays. And uh, which means that uh, the number of citations from the journal over the preceding two years divided by the citable articles. Next we will go to methods. This is very important part of assessing or doing critical appraisal of the article. Uh, is looking at the bias and how you, how the authors have made efforts to minimize the impact of bias. Another point which you need to keep in mind, what the confounding factors are, how it has affected the performance of the study or the results. So you need to look at these two things. And when we are doing that, we are really talking about internal validity of the study. In other words, how well that study has been conducted. All you are looking at is whether the authors are really comparing apples with peers, which obviously is meaningless. So you need to compare like with like and having one or two factors different. And that would really show the impact of one, the one factor which is different on the overall outcome. So that's what you are really aiming for. So as I mentioned to you in the beginning about the sample size, you need to have adequate sample size representative of uh, that population and should be addressing the question you are asking. So a little later we are going to talk about what actually the confounding factor is. So uh, this is the uh, slide which shows a situation wherein in a GP practice, prevalence of coronary artery disease was compared in obese numbering 68 versus those who had normal weight 139 is the number. It was seen that obese patients had 1.8 times more likelihood of having coronary artery disease which is dependent, dependent variable over here and independent variable being weight. The regression analysis showed that obese patients were more likely to be smokers. So that was the as a uh, afterthought, but uh, this would be in slightly different as you'd see that the obese patients had higher incidence of coronary artery disease. So it implies that obesity had the impact on the coronary artery disease. In contrast, the regression analysis showed that those who were obese were more likely to be smokers in that group. In this case, in this study, smoking is a confounding factor. So that confounding factor is going to have influence on the independent variable and the dependent variable. Now you need to look at the next type is whether it's a single center study or multi center study. Multi center study would have, as it would imply, would have much more generalizability than the single center trial. As you might know, if you're having a data from single trial, single center, it is called center effect. So when we talk about generalizability, it is another which I'm, word I'm going to introduce, which is external validity of a study. It means how easy it is to extrapolate 
the results and the findings from that study, that report into your own practice. We're going to talk a little bit about sample size. I've already highlighted the need for having very much comparable control group in comparison to the study group. It has to be quite similar. Now, in regards to statistical methods, it's a one slide which is going to address quite a few points. You need to look at whether data is normally distributed, which means it's an inverted bell uh, shaped distribution of data. That is normally distributed data. In that case, you can use parametric tests. In comparison, there can be, if the data is not normally distributed, you are going to use non-parametric tests. So when you are going to really read an article, you are going to ask the questions, have the authors used the correct test? If it were you, what kind of test you are going to use? So not only you are going to assess the article from the point of view of subject point of view, you're going to see how I'm going to use, uh, what kind of uh, statistical test I'm going to use, I'm going to really deal with that data. So that is the question you are going to ask all the time and make that list. So by the time you have gone through the article, you are with the list. Well, this is the way I'm going to improve upon this study. So the answer is ready there. One point which I'm going to highlight here is that primary endpoint. What is primary endpoint? It actually is the endpoint which uh, you need to really have, uh, it needs to have consonance with the question you are asking, which should be there at the outset, at the last sentence of the background or the introduction paragraph. There's sometimes patients, uh, uh, some of the studies would have co-primary endpoints. One of them could be rare and it could be more common. And at times, it, one can spuriously be under the impression that uh, the less common uh, co primary core point has had equal influence compared to the more common primary core point. So you have to be very careful when you look at, you need to look at the outcome in a way that co primary endpoint are not really being shown just for the purpose of uh, highlighting a rare event. Uh, in combination with the more common event and showing, oh yes, effect is there on both, which it may not be. Another thing which is uh, parallel versus crossover trial. What do you understand by crossover trial? As you know, we all are different. Each one of us, brothers, sisters, in the family, and friends, we all are different. We all react differently to any physiological stimulus. Uh, unlike the uh, car which is made by one company or aircraft which is going to behave exactly the same way if you uh, in response to a stimulus, our bodies react differently. So there is inter-individual variation which we need to be aware. And, uh, and because of that, in order to take care of that inter-individual variation, you need to have adequate sample size. What happens that the other way of dealing with that is doing crossover trial. Wherein group A gets drug 1, group B gets drug 2, after a certain time and wash over period, the crossover happens means group A gets drug 2 and group B gets drug number 1. And then you see the effect. And you can imagine that each one of these patients or individuals is acting as their own control. And because of that, inter-individual variation, that uh, error which would creep in otherwise is taken care of. What I'm trying to say is that in because of this reason, the crossover trial, the need for the sample size is much smaller compared to those uh, trials wherein you have got parallel groups. Next, we come to the randomization and allocation concealment. By the time the allocation concealment takes its effect and it finishes, the the randomization effect of randomization and the uh, blinding of the study that starts from there. So it basically randomization means each one of those uh, patients or individuals has got equal chance of going into different groups in a study. And that is beyond our control, yours and mine. It's only determined by randomization table or you give a phone call to central uh, randomization agency or you have computer which is going to be the number. Allocation concealment is 
the team which is allocating the patients to different groups is unaware of previous uh, allocations thereby suppose a new patient comes in the uh, study and if I'm in favor of one particular surgical procedure uh, or the other one and I see oh yeah this patient has got lots of comorbidities factors with lots of comorbidities and probably will have poorer outcome so if I know the previous allocations and I say that well chance of it going into one group is higher I might say, well, I may not be bothered about uh, this patient, will not really include. So all that process which a team should be doing to prevent the numbers, of the allocations done so far in a study, that the team which is giving the, doing the randomization should be unaware of that. That process is called allocation concealment. You need to see as a part of assessing the internal validity of the study, how well the investigators have tried their best to prevent the bias and uh, these errors. Coming to the next slide, I'll quickly go through this slide. We have already addressed some of the points like alpha error and beta error. So smaller the alpha error, bigger is going to be sample size. That's what uh, is going to help you to determine. I already told you, mentioned to you that a rare disorder will require much bigger sample size to really show a significant difference. The power studies I talked to you about uh, type 2 error. So type 2 error would uh, you need to really uh, the chance of it happening would be as small as possible if the beta error would be really kept to a, as small as possible. So beta error acceptable one is 20 percent or in other words a fraction of one as 0.2. You need to keep in mind the dropout rate. I've already talked about parallel and crossover. Obviously, those who are having the uh, crossover studies would require lesser number. The dropout rate, more the dropout rate, it is understandable. You have to require more, uh, some, uh, much bigger sample size. The ratio of treatment versus control arm, if it is same, then there is some certain number you would require. But if it is unequal, you are going to require much more number. I've already discussed the internal and external validity of the study and when the how well the study has been conducted how the investigators have taken care of minimizing the impact of bias or the confounding factors the errors how they have really uh, ensured that there's no uh, the allocation concealment is achieved to perfection and the renovation and it has been really achieved properly. So all that really you are looking at when you are looking at the methods and the results. And when you are doing it, compare it how I would have done it. So you have got the answer ready when the boss is going to ask, okay, uh, tell me Tony how you are going to do this study better. So you have got the answer ready there. So then we come to the next slide which shows internal validity. We have talked a few times about it. So we move to external validity and move to the point is there too much being projected too much being read into the results so that's what is we have to avoid we have to avoid being gullible means uh, just by reading the study doesn't mean that uh, you know it's written in golden words and I'm going to follow that and change my practice no you need to develop those proper skills of critical appraisal and that's what it is about external validity Level of evidence, as you can see, level one to level four. Level one would have is the highest degree of evidence, highest quality of evidence, and level four is the least uh, reliable quality of evidence. And uh, the difference you can really notice is that in level one, you would have the chance of bias happening and confounding factors would be minimized, which would not be so in level four. If it is a meta-analysis of properly conducted, well-conducted RCTs, that would make it level 1A evidence. Level 1B evidence is evidence from RCTs. So as it says that not always a meta-analysis would be 1A level of evidence. I might use this word which might appear to be a word. Uh, G-I-G-O, garbage in, garbage out. 
that's the expression which is used if you're going to do the meta analysis. It's quite fashionable nowadays, as Professor Bernardi will later on will allude to, using the different meta analysis, uh, and it's fashionable in many ways. It is easier. All you have to really save yourself from doing is that you have high quality, uh, unbiased articles, and you have to be uh, unbiased when you pick and choose articles. It is very easy to pick and choose articles uh, which would really show and tell what you believe. You have to save yourself from that kind of tendency. So if the data, the articles which have been used are of level 2 or 2D, the meta-analysis level also is not going to be higher than that. It will be same. As you can see, in level 2, the uh, control study will be included in that, which may not be properly uh, randomized. Level 2B would be quasi-experimental studies. Level 3 would be uh, descriptive studies. It would be the observation studies. Or it would be correlation or series of case, cases. As you can see, as you move further from 1 to 3, the bias is more and more. Expert have committee giving evidence and report and giving opinions is classified as level 4. It sounds rather paradoxical. Why should it be? Those are, after all, the experts. I must say that for clinical practice, that may be a good advice to follow the NICE guidelines or guidelines from Royal College of Surgeons. Uh, it comes from experience. But uh, there's no doubt that advice is quite biased advice. It may be correct advice, but it starts from the point of view of statistician, the bias is much more in level 4. So we move further. I will just highlight this uh, uh, slide, which actually I have taken from in Unit 3 duty room, where Professor Ramampur had uh, put this as A4 on A4 paper. In those days, in 86, the prostate cancer used to be diagnosed using acid phosphatase, unlike PSA nowadays. The PSA, uh, is, sorry, if you are going to use acid phosphatase in anybody who is coming through the drawer who are older than 55 years in a surgical clinic, the cost of diagnosing one prostatic cancer is 89,000 rupees at the time. It comes down to 16,000 rupees per cancer, diagnosed cancer, if you are going to use acid phosphatase all, uh, in those patients who come with the urinary frequency. It is further lesser if it is this investigation is performed in patients who come with urinary symptoms but also have got hard nodule on PR. As you can see that we need to really be using the investigation sensibly, carefully, and you use the investigation only when you to have a look at the result. You do an investigation when it is going to change a make a, a make a change in your practice, in your in the management of a patient. Although we know that uh, we are living in an era wherein the society is very litigious, you better do the whole battery of tests. But I'm talking about the utility of a test, the likelihood ratio, which we can address some other time. So likelihood ratio, which I would really just introduce this concept over here, is actually even more reliable than sensitivity and specificity. Sensitivity and specificity of a test depends upon whether you have done that test in GP practice, in secondary care hospital or a tertiary care hospital. That determines the reliability of that test. So it depends upon where the test has been done, which kind of group it has been done on. Now I'm going to put a, a series of some questions here. The one question is how important it is in your opinion of a doctor to be able to do the critical appraisal of literature. Please give your opinion, you know, it doesn't matter where you are working. In your opinion, how important it is for a faculty in a university hospital? And number two, if a doctor is working in a private hospital or if a doctor is a general practitioner working in primary uh, care setting. So how important on a scale of one to five you think is the virtue or the worth of having this skill? critical appraisal of literature. I can assure you that even somebody like me who has never had any training in statistics can do it sensibly. I have enough confidence because it has been, it's a routine here, it's a second habit. Hello, Dr. All I would Shabab. say is that, 
It's it's Dave. Yeah. We're sh we're showing the first poll question now, and so far, okay. eighty six percent of the people think it is very important for a doctor to be able to do a critical appraisal of literature if they are faculty at a university hospital. We have okay. 86% agree with that's very important and only 14% answered number three. There are no other answers for the other categories. I'm gonna close this one. I'll show the okay. results. Mm -hmm. Okay, I'm conscious of the time, limited time over here. You don't have to be a great statistician to be able to do the general club. That is my belief. That's the belief of uh, uh, people I know. Just to show you this picture again, which we showed in the beginning, you can have a general club just in a matter of 15, 20 minutes, half an hour, uh, in over a cup of coffee. Many thanks for your attention. So I would uh, come back to the uh, this webinar site. Okay, we do have one question. I'm going to send it to you. It's it's more a comment than a question. Here's your first one. As early on in your lecture, this person was not able to have a journal club because they're just an intern. Well, all I would say is that the whole team should participate, and I can tell you that two of them are interns. One is a registrar here, and. Uh, uh, as I say, earlier you start, better it is. Never too late to start, never too early to start that. I, I'm not sure whether that answers your question, or the question posed by one of the audience, one in the audience. I have another question I'm sending to you right now. And this is from Dipanj Dalela. Do you see it? Uh, so the, could you talk a little bit about the likelihood ratio? Likelihood ratio is actually the probability of that test. You know, if the test is positive, probability of uh, somebody having disease versus probability of having no disease. Uh, so it actually tests, uh, it, that is tested by likelihood ratio. It actually, if I tell you the formula, it is uh, formed by sensitivity divided by 100 minus the specificity. It basically is looking at uh, not just the, uh, the sensitivity of a test, but also uh, the, what actually is the rate of false positive results uh, in a particular study. So uh, uh, the reliability of a test is depends upon uh, so uh, how would the uh, high likelihood ratio is? If that likelihood ratio is something like uh, more than 10, it's a ratio, or less than 0.1, it is going to be a, uh, a good test. So as I mentioned, it's just the ability of your test to not just able to have true positives out of all those who have got uh, the disease, which is sensitivity, but also how well the test in that population can exclude false positives. So that is the ability of the test. I can give one example. If you are going to have a, you know, right eye like first pain somebody has and it is uh, done by, uh, the diagnosis of appendicitis is made by a GP compared to the same patient seen in an emergency surgical unit and seen by a consultant, uh, it would have the same test in two different settings would have different likelihood. It's just because it depends upon what kind of population the test has been tested on. Is there any other question, David? David? We have another question I'm sending you now. And it is, we are not confident in JC presentation because of unavailability of relevant articles and lack of interest of seniors. This is from Suresh Goyal. Uh, yeah, I think uh, it is our keenness. If you think we all have to really provide safe and effective treatment to our patients, uh, and uh, whether whatever oath we have taken, oath by Charak or by Hippocrates, uh, or you know self-imposed principles, 
All I would say is that we all have to strive to really know what is right, what is wrong. And that skill would develop if you develop practice. Of course, uh, I can understand you need to have the guidance of your seniors, consultants who should be able to take you through. Uh, yeah, it's quite a tricky situation that not everybody may have guidance. And therefore, I would say those who are interested, uh, it does not matter, they are very young in their career, they can really take this up, they can learn those skills using this kind of webinars and attending these uh, kind of uh, seminars on uh, web and develop those skills and take it further. Yeah, well, I, Ajay, I can see I think we may be coming to the end. We, we don't have any other questions here. Yeah, and I so can see yes, the uh, question is very, very pertinent. So is there any question or comment from Professor Bhandari? He had a wedding to attend, and he may have actually had to leave the webinar before you finished, and he didn't want to interrupt okay, no and say goodbye. That's why he's in okay, Cleveland okay, today. I, okay, I do realize that, yeah. I do <laughs> realize that, yeah. So okay. I think I'm going to take this time to thank you so much for, for giving of your time and your knowledge to everybody that, that attended today. And okay. I, I bid you goodbye. I bid our audience goodbye as well. Thank you so much for attending. Please watch your emails for announcements on the next Vatikuli Scholar session. Vatikuli okay. Scholar session should be in about two weeks. We should have another one on the, okay. in, on the next Saturday in two weeks from today. So everybody, thank you so much, and I bid you good day from here in Detroit. Thank you very much. Uh, greetings from Liverpool. Thank you very much, Dave.